I wish I knew now what I was thoroughly convinced I knew when I was 18 or 20 or 22 or even 24, or maybe 26 years old. I wish I knew now half of what I thought I knew then. And I'd be willing to bet if I was standing live in front of an audience of 10,000 people who are my age or thereabouts, and I asked the question, have you ever felt like you know less now than you knew when you were 18, 20, 22, 24 years old? I bet every single hand would go up because we all have that phase in our life where we are convinced that we are fearless and we are flawless and we know everything we need to know. Welcome to Leading Leaders Podcast, five minute videos, five days a week. I'm Jay Lauren Norris with Leading Leaders Podcast and I can tell you right now, if you wanna start a movement what you need are those who have strong minds and weak backs. As my high school sweetheart's daddy told me one time, he was building a shed and he said, I need someone with a, a strong back and a weak mind. And I said, I, I don't understand what you mean. He said, I don't need you to think. I just need you to shut up and do. Just do what I tell you to do. Move those boards over there. Move those bricks over there. And we spent about eight hours putting together a shed for him. He didn't want any thinking. He just wanted action. And the truth of the matter is that, that young people get recruited into the military between 18 and 24 for the same reason that their car insurance is really high between 18 and 24, and that is that they are at their prime physiologically. Their synapses in their brain are firing off faster than at any other time in life. Their ability to learn is still almost as fresh and open as it is when they're toddlers. Their bodies, physically though, the muscle density, the strength, the reflexes, all of those things are at their height. And yet the prefrontal cortex is still in development and therefore short-term and long-term consequences of their behavior, their choices, and their actions are not nearly as considered as they will be later on in life. I remember being a 10, 12, 14-year-old boy literally jumping off the roof of my house thinking, it's only 10 or 12 feet. What's the big deal? I remember going back and looking at that when I was a little older, maybe 30, and thinking 10 or 12 feet, that's enough to, to rip the cartilage loose in your knees, to, to, to break the bones on impact in your legs. Why would anybody do that? Well, it was me that did that because I wasn't smart enough to be scared. The, the challenge with a lot of movements is that they captivate this reality that if you can move them emotionally you can get them to do pretty much whatever you want them to do if you can provoke them if you can inspire them if you can motivate them young people become very passionate very quickly but they lack two things that make them both helpful and potentially dangerous. And that is they lack perspective. They can't from their own experiences step back and go, wait, when have I seen this before? What did it look like last time? What was the outcome of this event the last time it happened? See, there is no 18 to 24 year old alive right now who lived through the watch riots of 1968. In fact, there's no 18-year-old who lived through 9-11. Let that sink in for a moment. Some of the radical changes that have taken place on this earth, in this nation, in my lifetime, my children never experienced. And if you simply go back to the history books or Wikipedia or Google and look for better explanations for what happened, there's already 10,000 strings of information that may or may not be accurate. So you may or may not get a true picture of what happened. And you most certainly are not gonna get a good picture of the undercurrent of why what happened happened. I, I disagreed with Colin Kaepernick, for an example, taking a knee in protest of the national anthem or the American flag. I do not disagree with silently taking a knee to represent those who have been mistreated and suffered injustice. I challenge anyone who has 
a heart for humanity to just simply take a look at the history of the way people have been treated. And twice in my life, twice in my life, I've been in a place where the cab driver that I was paying to take me from point A to point B pulled over before they got to point B, stopped the car, and turned around and looked me in the face and said, from here, you'll have to walk because where you've asked to go is too dangerous for me. One of those was when I was trying to get to Battery Park in New York in 1998. The other of those was in Kinshasa in the DR Congo. And we walked another probably six miles after he dropped us off through the part of town that he didn't want to drive through because he felt like as a local, it was too dangerous for him. And guess who I was with? 18 to 24 year olds, fearless. They had no idea what kind of danger lurked there other than to say, a lot of people say this is a dangerous part of town, but we walked right through. It's pretty amazing how that fear gets embedded in us. It's pretty amazing how that segregation of people and peoples and people types get embedded in us. I, I've been a part of supporting uh, Tatiana Jefferson with my friend Bruce Carter, supporting raising awareness for her. I was there when the media came out and they did a, a vigil for her and her father and released the balloons into the sky. I, I was there when they, when they had a birthday party for her dad who lost his life to a broken heart. I was there. I was there when, when young African Americans came together to rally around downtown Dallas, right outside of Farrad Park. I provided the sound system and the stage to be a part of an event to get out the vote. When they were running for office, I helped with political campaigns for Karen K. Fluellen and other people in the downtown Dallas area to get out the vote, to get people's voices heard, to get them involved in local business. And I can tell you, even in that state, it's hard to get 18 to 24 year olds to change their mind, to move in a direction <clears throat> that's gonna better their lives. But if you can, then you must. I wanna leave you with this. I, I was listening to a webinar yesterday that really changed my perspective. After 10 years in marketing and another 10 years in motivational speaking and being a leadership coach, <clears throat> the confluence of these ideas hadn't quite gelled in my mind yet, but I can tell you now there are very few people teaching what I heard this gentleman say yesterday. His name is Justin McDonald. You can look him up if you like to. <clears throat> He's one of the principals, if you will, in the Africa Leadership University, uh, which I, I haven't figured out everything that I want to know about it yet, but from what I've seen so far, I'm pretty impressed. But he said this. He said, if you want to see the message and the mechanics of what you're trying to accomplish come together, the message and the mechanics will come together and you'll know that it's working when emotion begins to come from it. But if your message is off or your mechanics is off, there will be no emotion. And if there is no emotion, there will be no action. And if there is no action, uh, your customer journey is broken. <clears throat> he said, if you want instead for a buyer's journey, meaning if you want to motivate 18 to 24 year olds to take action in an arena that you wanna see a movement, then your buyer's journey has to be complete. From the very moment of awareness to the final taking of commitment, the actual arrival on scene to do what you've asked them to do. And he said, you've got to have three things for that to happen. From awareness to commitment, in the middle there must be the ability to get them to believe what you want them to believe or what they need to believe, to think what they need to think and to do what they need to do. Now, if all of that is selfish and motivated about you, you lose. That's where your messaging falls apart. If there's not a progress for them to go from awareness to action, then you lose because that's where your mechanics fall apart. But when your message motivates them to believe what they need to believe, to do what they need to do, to think what they need to think, and the mechanics of the process to take them from awareness to commitment, when those two things come together, then you'll see a movement that will change the world. I'm Jay Lauren Norris with Leading Leaders Podcast for Tell It Like It Is TV. Have a blessed day. Subscribe now for our next
extensive video library of leadership lessons promoting faith, family, and freedom. 